Make it! We good? We good? All right, shut, 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 shut. Okay. Good morning, Florida! I thought I'd give that a try. Hello, welcome to the adventures of Scotty Armstrong. This is my pilot episode of a 12 season trip from to various parks around the United States to give you me, my adventures. I am a big time trail hiker, uh, adventurer, and I have come with an art and science background and I am going to take you on my adventures. Today we are in not so sunny Florida, but I don't mind because it's nice out, it's 70 degrees. We are at St. Andrews State Park. I started my environmental career, my experience out in the field here at St. Andrews State Park as an AmeriCorps member. Some of the trails that we're going to be going on today, I laid the chips for. So it's kind of cool. It's like taking you back to where it all started. Whatever we see today, I will try to stop and give you the best interpretation that I can because that's one other thing I used to do when I was in the Park Service was give interpretations, particularly on uh, ecology, ecosystems, uh, keystone species, food chain, food web, etc., etc. especially reptiles. We're in Florida, lots of reptiles. About me, I have an art and science background with various degrees in both those areas. So you get the science and a little bit of the kooky, crazy artist uh, personality. I'll try my best to balance the two. This is the pilot episode, so this is totally raw. We're starting off, see how this goes, and as we move along, we'll try to uh, make it better. So, let's go.
southern leopard frog. We've been having a bit of rain of late. This trail is kind of underwater. That's cool. Not the first time I've walked through a watery trail. Won't be the last.
I am taking us into this spot right here because there's a deer, a pretty female deer staring right at us. But I have a second reason also. Let's see how close she'll let us get next to her. That was reason number one. Okay. Reason number two. I want you to come into this clearing right here. This clearing. I want you to use your imagination here. This clearing right behind me was a platform. It was a uh, stage. It was one of the first places um, in the public where I was able to teach. Um, my first interpretation here was on sea turtles, and I did the uh, seven species of the world during AmeriCorps. So this was a stage with seating, with benches, and Hurricane Michael and various other storms has wiped this learning area off the map. But I have memories of it, and I know this was one. This is the first place I really got to teach the public, and we had I. Stuffed sea turtles and we had all kinds of specimens and I even made a poster. It was about 15 20 feet long and I had all the sea turtles at their maximum length So like the leatherback sea turtle was seven feet and the green sea turtle was at its max and the the Hawksbill and the loggerhead and the the, uh, the Ridley's olive etc etc so and I, I just want and it was a sketch of kids so it was a bunch of kids from elementary school uh they were doing rotations they were going around st andrews and going from station to station to station uh some kind of activity area or learning area and they would come to my area and learn about sea turtles so this little spot right here which just looks like a bunch of grass has history for me and maybe some other folks who were able to come to this stage and look at an audience right there and there was a bunch of benches but that's ancient history now but that's okay new stages can be erected there's always new students learning continues let's go follow that deer see where she went she might have a family but that was uh the two reasons i came to this spot one for the deer and two for history personal history
I think we lost her. This is her home. She knows where all the good hiding spots are. Oh, I have talked about black needle rush to the cows come home. That's what you're looking at here. This is black needle rush and it hurts. If you come up to the top of these little uh, groupings here and you touch them on the top, when you poke them with your hand, they hurt. And they live where fresh water meets salt in brackish water. Because right over there is the inlet to the Gulf of Mexico. So there's just a little bit of land between that salt water and over here. So there's a higher salinity in this water than in fresh water. So the black needle rush here that you see in this huge field, they can tolerate it. They can tolerate just more salt than fresh water plants can handle. So they dominate this area. They have evolved to handle their conditions, their environment. I think that's so cool. So I have talked about black needle rush and many other brackish water species, like I said, till many a cow come home. Alrighty, well I, I think that is it for the deer. Now that trail will take us back to where we started our swamp loop, the pine flatwoods trail. So what we're gonna do now is go over to the lake, uh, Gator Lake. We might see an alligator, no guarantees. That's what's so cool about an adventure. You don't know what you're gonna see. It's different every time. So let's go over. Okay, this is gonna date this uh, episode, but I just saw Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Please go see it. I think you'll be getting your money's worth. It's in theaters right now. Freaking awesome. Totally worth it. One of the best movies I've seen in a good while. Okay, I did not get paid to say that. I'm just saying, because I that's what I believe. Very cool movie. I don't do not believe you need to be a Marvel Studios fan uh fan of marvel comics or the movies i just think it was a good movie and i really like china oh you see it That looks like something that doesn't want to focus. All right. Oh, there we go. Nope. He's like. Will you leave me alone? Leave me alone. Quit messing with me. I want to go to sleep. I was busy all night. I was busy all night. Leave me alone. Okay, I am done playing with this guy and his grass. I will talk about that fly later. Because they're really cool. And I tend to see them a lot of late. Okay, okay, okay. He's like, go away. I'm like, okay. He's like, I meant it the first time. Go away. Get out of my face, man. Get out of my face. Okay. He's getting upset. I can tell. He looks per perplexed and angry. Okay, we're going to go. Oh, a butterfly. Oh, we got a bunch of butterflies. Okay, so here in Florida, as we approach November, the butterflies really start to show themselves. And the monarchs, as we get clo closer to... November 
are really going to be coming through this area. Um, so much so that I have had many Novembers in Florida where there are they're everywhere. They're, I mean, they've gotten sprayed by the ocean water and they uh, they're dead. They are on the sand. They're in the bushes. There are just so many of them. They're heading they're heading south, coming through Florida on their way. These are not monarchs. These are. Yeah, so these are really cool butterflies. I see them a lot in suburbia and out here at St. Andrews State Park. Very cool. And they are being extremely cooperative with the camera. Okay, uh, where are we going? Yeah, we're going to Gator Lake. Let's do it. We might tend to get distracted when we have a mission, but that's okay. Oh, rabbit. Come here, rabbit. Get here. Come on. Oh, more butterflies. Man, they are out. Look at this. They are out. Whoa, 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 whoa. This one's got a busted wing. Did something take a bite out of you, my friend? Did someone try to suck your blood? Okay. Rabbit. Let's go see the rabbit. Uh, I think the rabbit's right over here. I see a bush a moving. You probably can hear my loud voice. I started off kind of quiet so you guys could take it in, but that's only going to last so long because I tend to talk a lot. And now that I have a camera and, I don't know, somebody who can listen, it might be one person, it might be ten, I don't know. I'm going to put this online. Y'all can have fun with it. But now... I'm gonna let my mouth do what my mouth likes to do with the talking. Lots of talking, talking, talking. Like I said, there's definitely an artist underneath the scientist. It's a very confusing duality. But that's me. Mr. Duality. Okay, let's get a gator lake. Focus now. Focus, focus, focus. Okay, um, just before we head to Gator Lake on this longleaf pine group here. You see all these longleaf pines? These are really tr tall pine trees right in front of me. I'm gonna come up on this one pine tree right in front of me. If As we go up the tree, there is a bird of prey that just flew up. I didn't get a good look at it, I can't tell. I think it's an osprey, but let's see if we can get closer before he flies off. Oh, 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 there it goes. Let's see how close we can get. Okay, and we're not going to get super close because he is camera shy. Okie dokie. Well, anyway, back to Gator Lake. Alrighty, we are back on our way to Gator Lake. We're definitely going to be passing some really cool spots on the way there. Um, there is, well, there's the garbage truck in the background. That's pretty cool. That makes some great noise. No, anyway, so... We have a pond on the right that is um, very popular with the bird photographers. Okay, can you see? I want you to look out in front of me about a 50 yards, there is a great blue heron. He's frozen. This whole area is loaded with egrets and herons. Let's see if we can get a better spot. They love to nest here at this park. There he is. Look at that plumage. right out in front and I see them all over and they definitely look like they are related to the peas in the pods very cool little lagoon and they are everywhere okay we are still slowly getting closer to Gator Lake and 
and out here is where I see a lot of the nesting birds, but they are not here. We got the great blue heron, but I do not see, don't see any white, great white egrets or snow egrets or cow egrets, little blue herons. Wow. All right, well. That's why sometimes You need to go on multiple days because you might score on one day and the next day nothing. That's what makes it an adventure. You have no idea what's going to be out here. You have a roughly good idea. But. All right, folks. Thank you. Uh, thanks to a awesome guy on the bicycle who I gave the thumbs up to. He gave us the heads up for a snapping turtle, a common snapping turtle. We're not close enough to be in the Florida snapping turtle range. And this is, doesn't look like an alligator snapping turtle with that long tail. Looks like a common snapping turtle. And he is a little guy. And he is covered in muck. So these guys will get fairly big. Very cool turtle. You grow up in Florida, you're going to come across either the alligator snapping turtle or the Florida snapping turtle if you spend a lot of time in rivers or near the shore. Really cool. Watch that mouse though. They will bite your, try to bite your finger off. Very surprised, no egrets. Maybe they're um, at the island at Gator Lake. There is a small little island inside the Gator Lake where many large stork-like birds from the stork family, your egrets, your herons, they, um, they nest there. And if you have a long lens camera, they do make for awesome photography, but um, I do not see them at this marsh. They're not here. And they've moved on. All right, let's go see if we can find a gator. Running on empty, running on. Forgot the rest of the words to this song. And running on empty. I'm running on empty, need the words to the sun. Okie dokie. All right, well, I do not see any white birds, and they stick out. I mean, a great white egret in this landscape, it sticks out. So let's go see what Gator Lake has. And that's gonna be on our left here. Beware of gators, they are for real. Please folks, do not do what I do. If I get fairly close to a gator, it's only because I've done it many times and there is a way to approach gators safely. You do need to be aware of gators at parks, especially though, because People tend to feed them, even though there's a sign that says, do not feed. You feed an animal that you have now provided a new food source and it loses its fear of man. If you're a little child with a piece of bread, that's not good. I mean, an adult with a piece of bread is not good, but for a little child, it's even worse. So let's not feed the gators. Don't do what I do. I've been doing this way too long to know how to do it and get out. This is definitely um, like the two, the two favorite shows I used to watch when I was a kid, Crocodile Hunter and uh, Jeff Corwin experience. I watch both those shows back to back. Don't watch what they do, but don't do what they do. If you see anything I do, do not do it. 
please be safer than me. <laughs> okay. Probably should have said that at the beginning of all this. Like I said, this is definitely a bird nesting site. Here's our please do not disturb signs. They are all over this park. There's a lot of endangered species that come through state St. Andrews for nesting purposes. I mean, I'll see anhinyas here. I'll see snowy plovers. I imagine with some of the longleaf pines here, we got various woodpeckers, bladed, cock cockaded. They might come through. Um, I also wouldn't doubt bald eagles come through here as well. I've seen them at um, Camp Helen State Park, which is just on the other side of the county. I've never seen a bald eagle here, though. Doesn't mean they're not here. Just because I didn't see it doesn't mean somebody else didn't see it. Okay, folks, here we go. Alligator Lake. Gator Lake. So, alligators, beware. They are dangerous. Do not feed. Look, right there. Number one. Do not feed alligators. And I don't really entice. I try to just get close. So, these are apex predators. They are top of the food chain. They eat everything below them. Turtles, snakes, fish, birds, and small mammals. That's one heck of a diet. But the only thing an adult alligator has to fear is humans or another alligator. Let's see. Let's go see what we can find. Going to Gator Lake. Gator Lake. Okay, here's a lot more recent sign. This one is nice. Nice photo. Do not swim with the alligator. Oh, look at this duckweed and pond muck. It's pretty green. So this is a trail, and like I said, we've had a lot of rain of late. So this trail is underwater. What an awesome place for an alligator to hide out. So do you see all this duckweed, all this green junk? So alligators, they will use it as camo, as camouflage. They will hide right underneath it with just their nose and their eyes sticking up hide that body they can get really close and ambush their prey so on that note i'm going to step back so if you were a raccoon or a small deer and you approach duckweed trying to find your your fresh water source maybe find some food an alligator will try to get as close as it can for that powerful strike try to pull its prey in drown it and then go stick you somewhere for future eating. American alligator, part of the crocodilians. They are our big boys around here. We really don't, we have black bear, Florida black bear. They're fairly small. We don't really have any mountain lion. We have coyote, even though they're technically an invasive, but the large predator on land or water land is going to be your american alligator i mean we got some predators out in the gulf of mexico but if we're talking land it's going to be the american alligator now when i was out in montana the big boy out there was the grizzly bear it tends to be i think wise on your part to know your apex predator wherever you are if you're in africa do you need to know if you're in hyena hyena territory or African lion, or the African lion territory. Or if you're in India, are you in Bengal tiger territory? So here in Florida, it's gonna be the American alligator. I'm not saying they're out to get you, but if you come up to the water's edge, this is their turf. Respect their turf. I have come as close as I want to for right now. I am. I know it was safe, safe for me. Do not do what I do. But that is it. I'm not gonna push the buttons. Because getting bit by an alligator is not a good day. All right, let's go see if we can get a little closer.
So as you can see, that is Gator Lake. Out there is the island. And I don't see any white egrets or snow egrets or even great blue herons. Looks like they've moved on. I guess they're done nesting. There's a time in the year, I think probably spring, or spring to late spring, that whole island is nothing but white. Like I just see feathers flopping around everywhere. We have had a lot of weather. They might've moved on also for the weather as well. Maybe you needed to move somewhere where there wasn't a tropical depression or storm coming through. Thank you, Freddy. All right, moving on. It's a little hilly around here. All right, here we go, here we go. So, lots of trails, lots of trails. All right, you see the uh, live oak here? You see what that's on, it's hanging on them? It's very typical deep south accessory to the landscape. Do you see this? This is uh, what they call Spanish moss. Yeah, isn't that crazy? I always love Spanish moss. I thought it was a moss, but it's not even a moss. It's not even technically true lichen. It's crazy that it's in the pineapple family. Is that just, that's freaky. When I heard that de that little detail, that little fact, I was just like, I had to go look it up. All right, moving on. Where are we going to? Oh yeah, we're trying to find a gator. An American alligator. Alligator Mississippianess. And by the way, I don't do a whole lot of Latin. When I was in my graduate program, I had to do a whole lot of Latin. Do I look Latin? I'm not Latin. Does anybody speak Latin anymore? Thank you, Carolinius, for keeping that going. I don't mind it. I appreciate it, but they keep changing it all the damn time. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the, I got to put a coin in the, uh, the swear jar. Anyway, Carolinius was a scientist um, about 150 years ago who came up with the binomial system for species and genius. Hey. Where was I? Sorry about that. So what happened there was I had a ribbon snake, an eastern ribbon snake, fly in front of me. And of course I was talking, was on my schmiel, and as it was flying by me, I had to think, do I want to try to interpret this eastern ribbon snake, put the camera down, or what? So I find eastern ribbon snakes at St. Andrew State Park all the time. I mean, they are everywhere. It's kind of actually hard to not go a, a, a visit to St. Andrews and not see them fly by. Um, we're getting past the dog days of summer, so they're really coming out. So I'm not, next time we'll try to get a better interpretation. They're a really cool little snake, um, relate, they're, they're in the, related to the water snakes and um, garter snakes. So anyway, um, and we'll probably see a water snake. Florida water snakes are pretty common in this park too. But I just wanted to talk about Carolinius and the whole binomial scientific way of categorizing all this. You see that plant right there? And do you see that plant over there? And all the birds and all the insects and the cicadas that are chirping and everything else. And oh yeah, even me, the homo sapien, homo sapien, genius species, genus species. Carolinius came up with this binomial system of trying to categorize animals. And, th and there's, that's where you get like this genus, species, the, the family, the order, the class, your phylum, your kingdom. Like I, I'm a primate. I'm a mammal. I'm in the animal. I'm in the animal kingdom. I'm a eukaryote. Oh my God! What is that? That's a big word. Eukaryote. I don't like using these words. Um, I find that if I'm going to talk science, I want to talk to someone who doesn't know science. And I guess that's where I fall into this. And this is this is my my soapbox moment. And this is where the artist is coming out. This this whole show is not for the scientist. It's probably not I me mean, really for the civilian scientists, people who go out and, and be scientists on their own. This is for someone who's new to science. I'm gonna try to give you common names. Now, in the YouTube spot down below, the species that we come across, be it plant, animal, fungus, which all have a kingdom, I will put their Latin, their binomial name there. And binomial names change. You might have a Laffe, which turns into Pantherifleus. 
Latin. That, that's a rat snake. But binomial names change in science, and that drove me insane. It nuts. Crazy. Because. So I'm going to give you the common name. So I'll say Southern Leopard Frog. And most, most likely, you're going to be able to go find what it's currently, its genius, Rana, and yada yada, and go find everything you can about it. And you, maybe you'll learn that the binomial has changed over time by Carolinius, this scientist. And I have nothing against Carolinius. Go Carol. 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 But for me, it's not my thing. So I'm very Mr. Common Name. I'll say Snapping Turtle. I might even say Common Snapping Turtle. But yes, they're in the world of science. They're probably not going to use that. They're going to use its species and genius. So instead of saying Florida Water Snake, somebody's going to say Nerodia. You don't have to memorize this. You don't. If you want to become more efficient in speaking science. Oh my God, I just did quotation marks like my fifth grade teacher. Miss Stivers, I loved her. One of the best teachers I ever had. She did quotation marks. These are going away. Um, but anyway, I want this to be for someone who, who who's maybe a little intimidated about science. And maybe this will help you realize it's not that scary. It's a it's a lot, but you, you as you get into it, you can get passionate about it and be like, oh, cool animals, plants, all this stuff, rocks, geology, climatology, oh my God, oceanography, marine biology. Ah, it keeps going. I can make a song out of that. Da -na -na -na. Okay. Anyway, that was my soapbox moment. Thank you, Carolinius. God bless. All right, so let's back it back on. Where are we going? Where are we going? Where are we? Gator Lake. Let's see if we can find a gator. No promises. This is an adventure. All right, so we are back on trail. Here we go. But Eastern ribbon snakes are really cool. Um, they don't get very big, much bigger than a pencil, like our big fat pencil. And they'll eat anything smaller than them. I've seen them eat fish. I've seen them eat frogs, some of their favorites, but they'll eat lizards, worms, anything that moves. But they do have their favorites. The garter snakes are, are a little bit bigger, very close related, like the Eastern garter snake that I have in my area. And they will eat worms and fish and frogs, even rodents, anything smaller in them. Pretty common. And then their aquatic cousin who spends a lot of time in the water, the Rhodia, the Florida water snake, they love fish. They love frogs. They love anything that's going to be in their swamp. And those are some of the most common snakes I see here. And now, since we're talking about the Florida water snake, that's a very common snake that gets mistaken for the water moccasin, which is venomous. And the Florida water snake is not. They have very similar uh, color patterns and uh, from, from infancy to adult. So people are very afraid of venomous snakes. And for a long time, people were taught a, a dead snake is a good snake, which don't, <laughs> I hate that. But they were just trying to protect them and their family and people around them. And the fear kicked in and let's just kill the snake. But even venomous snakes, even though they're venomous, they could be very considered very dangerous. They serve a purpose in this ecosystem. They help manage the trophic level below them. That is the food level where, where rodents and smaller prey live. They eat that, that prey. They, eat, they take in that energy. They move the energy along. You have energy coming from these plants, which got their energy from the sun, wherever the heck it is, way over there. As these plants take in the energy, something eats the plants, and then something eats them. And then something eats them. And then eventually it makes its way to humans. No, but like it works its way up the food chain. So to remove the water moccasin, any snake or any snake is any dead snake is a good snake. It's bad. You're, you're, you're messing with the trophic levels. Now that's in my opinion. Don't do that. If you see a water moccasin, leave it alone. Let it, let it live, let it live. And unfortunately, the Florida water snake, which is harmless, non-venomous, looks like the water moccasin. So it gets accidentally murderized by folk. And water snakes do suffer um, the same plight as water moccasins. Now, if somebody saw a corn snake, aka the red rat snake, they don't typically like freak out because it's identifiable. It's orange and red. The common person knows that's a pretty friendly snake. But unfortunately, Florida water snakes Band, or Florida banded water snakes, they look like water moccasins. And unfortunately, that could mean an early death. Phew. Okay, we are Gator Lake. We finally made it. We're the gators. I don't care. Let's go. I'm tired. No. All right, so here's Gator Lake. Can you see the sign? 
it's light. Okay, see, duckweed, hello, gators under duckweed. All right, so, Gator Lake, we are here, here. We did all the trail, here's the lake. Here's the cautionary tale, beware. Here's the duckweed, here's the cautionary tale. Duckweed, cautionary tale. I need to step back now. Now, in the past, when I have come to this trail, this whole area is not flooded. The flood banks are definitely uh, saturated. But like right there, right there, I have seen an eight foot gator. I mean, big. And I was this distance. And I have to say, I got fairly close to it. I hate to say that maybe I got close enough that, you know, we could have shook hands. Now, I say that because that's bad. It, me getting that close to a gator, even eight feet, is bad because it means somebody most likely broke the cardinal rule. Which is not on the sign. It's not on the sign. Don't feed the alligators. They should put that on the sign. Don't feed them. When you feed them, they now see humans as a food source. I should not have been able to get that close to even an eight foot alligator because even an eight foot alligator fears humans. It's in their nature to get the heck out of here. I have seen 10 foot alligators get the hell away from me because, oh, okay, I gotta put a quarter in the swear jar. Dirt! Another quarter. Okay, I'm gonna be broke by the end of the day. So that gator was fed tourists they don't care they're not from here they're from somewhere else so they feed the alligator the alligator goes mmm humans a food source maybe I'll sit here and get even closer to this nice trail to wait for the next human to come by and then some poor person will pay the price for people breaking the rules now I like to test an alligator to see if it's been fed or not a lot of times if they're under five years old barely young and they haven't met a whole lot of humans, they are out of here. As soon as I get close enough to maybe like this sign, which I have on camera, they book it. They are like, you know, grease lightning. They're out of here. But that eight foot alligator from my past, which was right, right there, um, it didn't. So I remember talking to a, a park manager, really nice guy here, his name was Bruce. That was when I was in AmeriCorps, really nice guy. He would tell me like, you know, I have a job for you. I want you to go put some wood chips out on, on the trail uh, over near uh, the Pine uh, Flatwoods Trail. I would do all that. He told me back in his day, um, they had to get an eight footer and relocate because the American alligator, my finger is alive, um, the American alligator was on the endangered species list in the 80s. Can you believe that? So they were hunted for their hide, for their meat, uh, well, for bush meat, but um, there was a market for their hide, you know, the alligator boots and alligator um, suitcases. So they were they had put on the Federal Species Protection Act for animals and through animal alligator farms and, and some really awesome conservation efforts, the American alligator is a huge success story. I mean, easily in the state of Florida, there's a million alligators. They have rebounded and are totally off of the um, fairly protected Endangered Species Act. So, he says now, if that is the case, um, they they might just put the animal down. I do not know if they still do that, but I was told that at the time when I was told that the policy changed from relocation to, which is sad, but you know, if you're relocating an animal that is not afraid of humans anymore, just taking it somewhere else out in nature where somebody could be in their boat, you know, row, row your boat, or fishing or whatever, they might come across that same alligator that got relocated and the same incident happens. And well, there we go. We, we hear it in the news. Some guy got attacked by an alligator. So they shoot. But back in the day, um, yeah, they uh, relocated because they were so there were so few of them, they couldn't euthanize. But that's what I heard. I do not know the current policy. I imagine um, relocation costs some money and you have to go deep enough in the woods, hopefully that you're away from, from human populations. But yeah, it's changing times. It's great. I wish every animal got off the Federal Endangered Species Act. I'm losing my voice. Anyway, 
I am just going to let my finger do all of it, but... Do, 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 do. <laughs> okay, anyway, I, I had to do that. So, there you go. Do we have an American Alligator here? No. Do I have tons of photo and video? Yes. There is a park, but not very too far from here, called Conservation Park. That is a county park, a city park. It is not a state park, which I know where some alligators like to hang out. So, that will probably be episode one. This is the pilot. We are definitely seeing if people can tolerate my voice. I started off slow. I didn't want to scare you all away on the first go. But, you know, you can only keep the lion in the cage for so long. Okay, let's go see if we can find anywhere else a gator might be hanging out. And then we might have to call it because this battery is good for about two and a half hours. And I can tell I'm already down to 13%, but that's okay. We will come back tomorrow and see if we can one more time to conclude our St. Andrews State Park um, visit. I will edit. We'll see what we get. And I will put it online. And I hope you guys like it. And this is the pilot. And I'm trying my very darn best to give you guys whatever's in my head. And you definitely get my personality and spirit and everything else because there's no way I'm going to keep that in the lid. Keep that in the pot. The lid is off. Here we go. No white egrets over there on that island. No American alligators right here. Still beautiful as heck. I, I like duckweed. When I see duckweed, I go, cool, swamp, man. There's probably a gator in there. All right. Here's our sign. Let's see what else we can see. And by the way, I came here when I was like 10, like nine or 10. So I'm taking you to my little special area. I have been up and down this park and it's really special also that I, I got to say I worked in the environment first at St. Andrews. This was my base, District 1 headquarters of Florida. Uh, the Florida Park Service, they have five districts, or at least when I was in AmeriCorps, they had five districts. I imagine they still have it zoned that way. There's about 30, 25 to 30 parks in District 1. It's about from about from where Pensacola is, just below, before Perry, Florida. There's a lot of awesome parks, a lot of beach parks, but a lot of inland parks too. And this is St. Andrews. This is definitely a home away from home. My my sanctuary, my fortress of solitude. I mean, that's only appropriate since I am wearing a Superman shirt. But anyway, um, let's continue. It's definitely my island of fort or my island of uh, solitude. I come here by myself a lot because I typically put five miles on my boots every morning. And not many people like to start their morning off going to do five miles. Now, when I was a younger chap, I used to do 10. That is my current goal, is to get back to 10. Because you can see a whole lot of um, the flora and the fauna, that's animal and plants for you folks out there, by covering more ground. You don't know what animals are gonna cross your path. So if you cover more miles, you're increasing the chance that animals are going to cross in front of you, you increase the chance. If you just stand still, yeah, they might come across in front of you, but go cover more ground, you up your chances. And typically animals don't want to be near you, so you need to go cover more ground anyway because they want to get the heck away from you. Every reptile I've looked at so far today, an insect wants to get away from me because they might think I'm a predator and I want to eat them and do bad things to them. And and they might be like, you didn't you didn't talk to my agent. You didn't get this, you know, approved for for me to be on camera. And that's true. I didn't ask any of these guys to be on camera. I'm totally paparazzi in it. But whatever. <laughs> okay, you remember that trail in the uh, just before we got into Gator Lake? Well, this is the back end of it. That's a trail. I'm not going through that because, uh, yeah, we we we've had the whole talk about. about the gators anyway oh by the way if you want to kind of understand who what kind of person i might be when i was in americorps i tend to like to sleep in trees and climb trees this tree right here was my sleeping tree i believe chris roberts awesome guy i think he's now a park manager or park assistant manager took a picture of me Climbing this tree right here and getting all the way out to the end of this tree right there. And he's got a photo of me in full nap mode, like a leopard up in the tree. Now, I didn't bring up no a gazelle for dinner, but I definitely used to sleep in this tree because it was so damn awesome and comfortable. And I was 19 
and a little bit wild just a tad bit <laughs> yeah well, that's changed but anyway I used to sleep right there and there is a photo and I wonder if Chris Roberts you're awesome dude I wish we still weren't still in contact man <laughs> look me up I think he's over at Topsail State Park or Walton it's over in Walton uh, Walton County awesome guy look like Bill Murray awesome definitely one of the coolest people in my AmeriCorps team but yeah so I used to sleep in that tree okay here we go we're gonna have to probably eventually cut this day done wrap it up because I am getting low on battery so we did what we wanted to do here we did two trails we did the Gator Lake Trail and we did the Pine Flatwoods Trail. Sorry, I was having major brain fart there. Okay, so we are gonna go back to the deck. I wanna see if um, there is a deck platform where you can see the gators and Okay, we are getting close to the end of this battery. I just wanted to get us to the platform. Hang in there. I have more batteries coming in the future, so we can get more out of our day. But hey, every season starts off kind of on that what the heck are we doing type of feel. I remember one of my favorite shows, if not my most absolute favorite show from the 80s is MacGyver. And that first pilot, that first season, they were trying to feel out what the heck they were gonna do. My second favorite show would probably be Star Trek The Next Generation. Also, first couple seasons, first season especially, they were trying to figure out what the heck they were gonna do. So I would say the adventures of Scotty Armstrong are very similar to any other TV show. The pilot, the first season, we're trying to figure out, you know, our footing, but that's good. We're, we're going to grow together. Let's grow. Hopefully it'll grow fast. I don't want to grow slow like a, a longleaf pine. I want to grow fast like bamboo. I'm very impatient. We're rolling. Oh. Good, 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 good. All right. Good morning. Florida, it is much sunnier day today. As you can see, I'm trying my best to stay in the shade and then get out of the sun. We are in day two of St. Andrews State Park, our pilot episode of The Adventures of Scotty Armstrong. Thank you for being here. We first need to recap on what happened yesterday. We did a full tour of the trails that are on the east end of St. Andrews. We did uh, Pine Flatwoods Trail and we did the Gator uh, Lake Trail um, that took us over to where we're hoping to find gators. I'm hoping today we find gators because we didn't find them yesterday. We need to go over a couple of the ground rules when you're in a state park. I forgot to mention that yesterday. We are in a state park. This is part of the Florida Parks uh, system. All plants and animals here are protected by the Department of Environmental Protection. We cannot take any plants or animals. We can't touch them, can't molest them, can't do anything to them, but set, except watch them and look at them and take memories of them. Camera, great way to take memories. You leave, you leave foot, footprints in a park, you take memories. So that's what we, we are, are doing here. Same thing in a national park. Now, if you're out in just suburbia or wherever, out in the woods, not a state park, and you see an animal, you, you can take a little bit more liberty to touch it, try to, to get a good interpretation of it, etc. So yesterday, I did see an Easter ribbon snake. I did see a common snapping turtle. And at the very end, when my camera died, her, I need more batteries, I did see a Florida banded water snake. So what I'm going to do is stop the camera and you're going to see stock footage of these three species from somewhere else, not St. Andrew State Park. So you can get a close up of when I found them. Actually, I found them in suburbia. They were in a neighborhood. Wherever there's water or you know a food source, I find these animals, they are all over. So I'm going to stop the camera. You're gonna see stock footage. And what I did was, is I put dialogue on top of that footage that's relevant to yesterday. So you'll hear me refer to things that was going on 
yesterday. I even mentioned the whole Carol Linnaeus thing. He's great. I love Carol. Um, but it's gonna. It, I tried to incorporate it into the editing, and I was just like, why don't I just give them a moment to see it between the two days, and then we'll move on. So you're gonna see those three species, and after it's done, I'll see you right back. Snapping turtle, and you can see his mouth threat display there. It's pretty, pretty uh, prehistoric. This is not an alligator snapping turtle. This is a common snapping turtle. It's not a Florida snapping turtle because we're not in the peninsula. We're outside that range. So this would just be your common, common snapping turtle. He's got a long, long tail. See how long that tail is? Okay, dude. I know you're getting stressed out. All right. I just want to get a nice little close up of this guy. He's just a baby. I've got him so big where I got to put my hand behind the neck and one back near the back part of the shell, like easily a foot and a half. They get fairly big, fairly heavy. And then I'll give a um, better, more detailed description. I won't let this guy go because he is getting stressed. All right, dude. See you later. Little uh, adult ribbon snake. You see he's not much bigger than my thumb. But I just want to get a nice close-up of him. He's got a little bit of that garter snake side. If you ever seen a garter snake, they have that pretty pattern of like fleckling when the ribs open in and out and as he's breathing hard you can kind of see that blue fleckling right there garter snakes have it too these are close cousins to the um garter snake he, this guy's got big eyes he loves frogs he loves fish okay just want to get a nice close-up of him they're all over st andrews i have seen them many many times at st andrews state park just want to get um up close personal uh close up the face all right, I, he is pretty stressed out, so I'm just gonna let him go. Here we go, dude. There he goes. Bye bye. About the Florida water snake, the banded Florida water snake. Well, here he is. I was able to uh, find one that was sunbathing. You can see those bands down the side of its body. This is the Nerodia I was talking about. They're very common. This is the snake I told you that gets mistaken for the water moccasin. They're all over St. Andrews. I mean, it's, it's got a lot of marshes and lakes. So, I mean, these guys are all over. This looks like a, looks like a pretty boy. They don't get much bigger than this, maybe two to three feet um, full grown. The girls um, can be um, a little bit bigger. Uh, really pretty snake. This is, like I said, look at that pretty pattern underneath the belly, close relative to the garter snake. They're, um, they're not far off from, from the ribbons and the garter snakes. They have a similar uh, pattern just below the eye. If you look real close, very similar to the garter snakes, that pattern just below the eye, um, that upper lip pattern. So he, this is the day's getting kind of hot. We're nearing 11 o'clock. I'm gonna let him go because it is getting hot. And if I do too much with these animals, they are going to stress out. And believe it or not, reptiles like humans can get heat stroke and they can have a little heart attack, a little stroke right in front of me. So I'm just gonna let him go. We got a nice, beautiful close-up of his pattern, but I'm gonna let this guy go. See you later, dude. All right, y'all. Let's move on with our adventure. Hello? Hello? All right, we're back. So, you just saw those three species. Um, they were taken a while ago. I have many a video of an animal and plant. We're going to go through, again, the same trails that we did today. I'm not going to show as much of the trail, except more of the highlights when we um, come across a species of interest. You want to do more plants, Hoping to find an alligator today. This is an adventure. You never know what you're going to see. Maybe a ghost crab. There's some, I, I gotten some great photos of uh, ahinyas or uh, great blue herons flying over. Maybe some interesting insects. You never know. I'll take a really cool lichen or fungus. So we're just going to go see what we can see. At the very end, I have a bunch of small snapshots of various species that I saw that came by so fast. I couldn't even say anything, but I'm going to put them at the end. And I'm gonna see if you can figure out which ones they are. And I will have a list of my interpretation of what I see at the very bottom. I will also have a list of what we know we saw and we actually were able to talk about, like the, the, the longleaf pine and uh, we saw great blue herons, we saw um, the Eastern River snake, etc. So that will be at the very end inside the YouTube page where comments will be, where I can leave a, um, a list. And then when you're done watching this video, this pilot episode, you can see those species and then you can go and research yourself and learn more about them and then if you're out out doing your adventure and you see them you'll you'll be more familiar with them all right second half of sandra state park let's go finish it up all right well i'm next to the pond i see a bunch of butterflies doing their thing we will talk about them later 
So what I have here is saw palmetto. I've been up north, been out west, and I don't usually see these guys a whole lot. I definitely see them in Florida. They have a nice painful uh, edge to them. It can be very uh, painful to the tips. They do hurt when you start running through the woods and you go smacking into saw palmetto. They're part of a, a group of vascular plants, a whole order of palms. And there's many other ones that are here in Florida too, like the cabbage palm and many others. But the saw palmetto is pretty frequent. You're gonna see that on the ground. And it's very um, wildfire tolerant. It can handle wildfires and wildfires and it bounces back pretty pretty well. So anyway, I just I just cannot not think of Florida's uh, pine flatwoods and not bring up the saw palmetto. Amongst the saw palmetto right here, I noticed um, a tall bone set right in front of me. See this pretty white flower? Very cool. I remember seeing them up in, in Indiana, Michigan area. And one interesting uh, fact about them is that they prefer a limestone bedrock. You're typically going to find them when there's a limestone bedrock available. So anywhere on the eastern coast from Canada down to Florida over to Texas. Very cool. Okay, we're in the southeastern United States. We're in the we're in Florida. It's hard not to see these guys right in front of me. And they are native. Plenty of invasive versions of these. But what I got right in front of me along this walkway's side rail right there is a little green lizard. It is a green anole. A little juvie too. It ain't even full grown yet. Let's see how close he'll let us get. Now these guys got a cool little dewlap when they're full grown. That's how they uh, display to their mate. Males will have a big pink dewlap. And they'll be like trying to attract the female. They're like, hey, look, I'm big and impressive. I have this big fleshy flag. Don't you want to mate with me? So I see this little guy. And he's about ready to jump. And he's going for it. Let's see how close he'll let us get. There he goes, going up. He's going for it. He's like, what the heck is this guy doing? He's bothering me on a Sunday. He's loud and obnoxious. I just wanted to drink my coffee. Tonight's football, leave me alone. Okay. So that was a green anole, and there's many other anoles here. We've got brown anoles, crested anoles. You know, between the Cuban, the Bahamian, there's so many. And we're not in southern, southern Florida, where they got like the night and knoll and a bunch of other ones that kind of, you know, hitchhiked their weight here in Florida. Because I didn't get into all this yet, but we've got like a thousand plants and animals, give or take, probably more than a thousand, um, invasives, as in they were not here pre-colonial times. There are certain animals and plants that have been here for thousands and thousands of years. But thanks to us humans, they have we have new members here. We have new hitchhikers. We've got chameleons and geckos, parrots, monkeys, big pythons, and etc. etc. Heck, we've got coyotes that live now in Florida that did not maybe about 500 years ago. So, if you work in some fashion, some form or fashion in the environmental world, most likely you're probably going to have to work with a mesis, which means eradication or some way of getting rid of them. Most likely, eradication transplantation, moving them somewhere else, that's very costly. So when it comes to plants, you're talking herbicide, and I don't want to get into the whole animal thing. It gets pretty rated R. But anyway, so that was a native. Green anoles are what are supposed to, by the book, live here. But there are so many invasives, it's hard to really start saying, well, what's not supposed to be here and what's, what is? I mean, when does an animal acquire its position in the ecosystem? And this gets into a whole lot of debate. But if an animal has been in an area for 500 years, is, is it still an invasive? I mean, I guess it's how you look at it. But when it comes to the world of environmental protection, I know at least with the Park Service, they're trying to make the real Florida. So that means probably more of a pre-colonial introduction of species. So, and also that means also the altercation of the environment. For instance, a lot of the southeastern United States was longleaf pine ranges as far as the eye could possibly see through Georgia and Alabama and Florida, etc., etc., there were longleaf pine stands and they went forever. But colonial times, post colonial times, we've got the English, the Dutch, and many other European countries taking down those lo big longleaves because they made great ships. But unfortunately, by taking down that longleaf pine, which they're right there, 
they take a long time to regrow. So while they're regrowing, other natives, or also invasives, but even natives that are more uh, ambitious, uh, faster growing, they, they're advantageous. They get in, in and they grow in those spots where the long leaf were taken down for the, uh, the lumbering industry. So we have changed the Southeast United States, among other ecosystems, to its from its original pre-colonial times. So you've got oaks taking over areas and other invasives. I mean, shoot, um, there's so many invasives that used to just be sold at your landscaping gardening section at your typical retailer, but we don't do a whole lot no more, but the damage, if you want to call it damage, has been done. Damage is very subjective in the world of environmental protection or at least in biology, because one one plant plant's plight is another plant's, you know, success. And I guess it's how you look at, you know, what, what's your goal? If you want an ecosystem just to be going forward, and depending on how much growth you want it to produce, how much net growth, invasives can still produce a lot of net growth. But if you're trying to make something specifically how it was in the past, yeah, invasives are gonna are gonna change, you're gonna alter that plan. So you're gonna have to t knock out the invasives. Invasives do many other things too. I mean, they bring disease, they, they knock out other plants and animals competition. They are competition, they can uh, affect the food source. There's a whole freaking thing just on invasives that could be done a whole show forever on invasives, which I don't want to do. This is my soapbox moment. So there you go, invasives. So where were we? We were looking at this little green and old that, that's probably way gone now. But I talked about invasives. It's really hard not to bring it up in a state like Florida, which is kind of in the border of tropical, subtropical. I mean, as we're getting hotter and more wet, um, more days where rain is dropping, we're probably becoming more tropical. Um, a lot of what makes tropical what tropical is, is a certain temperature and how much rain of during the year drops. How many days of the year, how much rain? Are you getting so many inches of rain or are you getting a majority of your year? Are you getting 200 days of rain? Are you getting 250 days of rain? So, you know, you could have, you don't have to have a tropical rainforest, you can have a temperate rainforest. A good example would be the Northwestern United States. So, anyway, <gasps> butterfly! Okay, that was my squirrel moment. Love that guy. We are definitely going to talk about this species of butterfly. Okay. We need to keep moving because uh, the battery is only so good for so long. Okay. Look, look. Ghost crap, ghost crap, ghost, ghost crap. Ghost crap. Ghost crap. You see this? Whoa, dude. Okay. You see that hole right there? That is the home of a ghost crab. We are only so far away from the um, the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the inlet. So this really sandy um, white Emerald Coast beach sand that we have here is very good substrate for the ghost crab to make its den. And I saw one earlier. This is a very pretty white ghost, uh, white ghost, white crab, known as the ghost crab, that um, you'll see scurry back in their hole pretty darn fast. And they blend into this white sand, like amazing. I mean, they've got a slight yellow tint of color, but it's mostly like a white gray, and they get the name ghost. So I'm hoping to see them, get them on camera. They are pretty darn fast, but this is a den for sure. I did see one earlier, but he was like out of there before I even pulled the camera out. So. He's like, too slow, dude. So let's see if we can find these guys. You can see the tracks right there. You see those little marks? That came from him as he walks sideways because crabs do tend to move at a lateral direction. All right, let's hopefully we can get one on camera. One thing you're gonna notice that when you're at St. Andrews State Park is the dunes with the seals that uh, they are sprinkled over the top of the dunes. As you can see behind me. And you're gonna see a lot of signs when you're at St. Andrew State Park saying, stay off the dunes. Now, those signs are there for a good reason. Those dunes act, serve in a few different ways for the ecosystem of St. Andrew State Park. They act as a home for various species like beach mice and various shorebirds. But not only are they adding a, um, a habitat, an area for, for an animal to live and make a burrow and find food, but also it acts as a natural barrier to storms, hurricanes, uh, the, which is very typical here in Florida. They provide protection to the marshes and the freshwater ponds and the, uh, the pine woods behind them. They, uh, they're just a natural barrier. So 
if we walk on those dunes, we erode them, we degrade them, uh, we make it, uh, we knock down the CO2, we make it hard for the vegetation to rebound. So when you build along um, the dunes and you put structures in the way or you do anything that, that can, can alter that natural growth of the dunes, because dunes come and go, they grow, they, they come with the wind, they come with the new sand that is deposited, you can affect the whole ecosystem because if the dunes were not here, it'd be very different for the for the, fi uh, the pine uh, flatwoods behind them. Uh, they might start to get degraded, degraded and could go bye-bye. So the dunes are very important. So when you see signs that say, stay off dunes, do not walk, they're not doing it just to, you know, they're doing it for a reason. They, uh, they, they have their, their purpose. So stay off the dunes. Let's try to keep um, that protection there for everything behind it. And so that the beach mice and all the other animals that live in the dunes have a place to live. So, alrighty. And as you can see right in front of me, this is a good example of sea oats. And I can see in the background some footsteps going up that dune right there. So he was not listening to the sign. Listening as in they were not reading and thinking it out. I don't know how you can listen to a sign. It's a bunch of words. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so sea oats. They root into the dunes. They help make the dunes strong. They help the dunes grow and get tall. So all very important. Do not want to degrade the dunes. They are so important for the ecosystem here. Beautiful day. All right. Okay, I don't know if you can see it right there, but I am surrounded by little hermit crabs. Now, what's really interesting, I took the trail off, just off to the coast. I'm looking at the inlet that takes you um, into the, uh, the, uh, the strait there. So if you, if you keep heading right and go around the, um, the corner there, you will be at um, the pass that takes you right to the Gulf of Mexico. Anyway, so I'm on the north end of the park, and look what I got right here. It is a hermit crab. But what's really interesting is, is what I'm looking at is three different species. So, yeah. So what's going on here is, yes, we do have a hermit crab. We have a crustacean inside. I don't know if you can see. Oh my gosh, we got tons of animals here. So in here is a little crustacean, a uh, hermit crab. It's like related to the shrimps and crabs. And then it, relies on another animal it relies on the snail this looks like a, is it a looks like a crown conch so this is a snail and it's not a crustacean it's like a gastropod so this sea gastropod dies and then this crustacean makes a home of it but as this crustacean is moving around with the dead snail um on its back it's got barnacles living on the outside of it. Let's get this in the light because you guys probably can't see what I'm talking about. So these barnacles are living creatures. They're another type of crustacean. Barnacles are related to uh, lobsters and shrimp and everything else in that huge family. Crustaceans are huge. It is a huge freaking family. So, and I think I see another little it looks like a, a type of uh clam or uh muscle living yeah on top of on top of the surface of the snail shell so we got like four species there might be some more in here living all or well we have three living we had one we have one dead one but in the ocean if you can find a home if it be um sea grape seagrass uh kelp a dead snail shell Animals are gonna take advantage of it because it, it's about hide and seek when it comes to the ocean. And if you need, you need to find a home, or something's somebody's gonna eat you. So a really interesting little find. I mean, you, somebody could just look at that and be like shell. But there's like four different types of life forms going on here. It just depends. You just gotta open your eyes to nature. Open your eyes. Open your eyes, Quade. Start the reactor. Okay, I'm done. All right, moving on. And I'm back over near that black needle rush that we talked about yesterday. I'm getting closer and closer to like the main, the main sedge area. So we know we're in kind of a brackish area. There's our salt, our uh, salt uh, water tolerant, brackish water tolerant uh, black needle rush. Right here, which I've been seeing all over, is bladder pod or bag pod. And you know how I, I know this is a legume and there's a big tail tail. Do you see the little pea pods? The little like, look like little green bean pea pods. 
that's a big telltale that you're probably looking at a plant in the legume family. A lot of the seeds are arranged in a row. Whoa, if this thing would stop moving, wind, whoa. Okay, so, whoa, seeds are arranged in a row. And you might, you might see a little legume that sticks to your socks. There's plenty of them. They have a seed pod. They're a little pain in the butt. So they're like hitchhikers, but they're arranged in a row. Typically, you can have anywhere from two or three to like 10. And we eat legumes, a lot of legumes. So you got legumes that are wild and you got legumes at the grocery store. And this is um, a bladder bladder pod and they're very common in North America. And I see them all the time. I just thought I'd give a little shout out to the legume family, you know, gotta, you know, give my respects. All right, moving on. Yeah, a lot of respect, by the way. Look at this. This is like legume central. Bladder pod, bladder pod bladder pod and a whole bunch of bladder pods so who is the mother plant here Ooh, that's a good one what's a mother plant so a mother tree might be this old plant or tree in this sense that i'm trying to use as my example that might help to uh, distribute its offspring its seeds to a whole area and you might have a whole uh clearing over time become a, a one species hammock, a one species area, because this one mother tree was, was dispersing the seeds. And it might've got helped by squirrels or birds or other animals, but if it's big enough, just by wind and the size of it, it could, it's starting to drop its seeds underneath it. And you'll see little seedlings that are related to it. It's the mother tree. So when you see a, a large grouping of a certain species, it's a very good chance um, they're all related. Um, or there was, uh, something that was helping disperse to it, helping disperse to its area to, to get that large grouping going. So if you find that you're underneath an, a big oak tree, but there's and there's a bunch of little oak saplings everywhere, that mother tree's been doing its job. So all right, good stuff. Gotta keep moving. Gotta remember, I have a battery. Okay, coming around the trail where we saw that deer yesterday. Another plant that always kind of sticks out to me that definitely makes me think of Florida is the wax myrtle. I have this right in front of me. Do you see those little berries? That's a good sign to know that you got wax myrtle, but also the leaves where they get the name. The, the leaves are shiny and they, they have a, a waxy-like appearance to them. So the, this plant, the wax myrtle, is in the same order. It was like oak trees and walnut trees and beech trees. And so, it, you know, it very, very large group, uh, uh, very large order. So um, I believe their genus is the in, the bayberries. So very cool. It makes me think of flora a lot. It's right there. The saw palmetto is the wax myrtle. So very cool plant. It has I know it has some medicinal uh, purposes too. So just just awesome. Definitely want if you want to look further into this plant, go right ahead. I love people who go and do further research. I just saw a blue-tailed skink, which can get confused with the broad-headed skink. And it definitely uh, is something uh, worth looking into because they share a, co uh, a coevolution, a, uh, a similar uh, appearance from baby to adulthood, the broadhead skink and the, uh, fi uh, the five line skink or blue tailed skink. Very cool. Um, you'll notice uh, there's a difference with like the females and the adults. You might have a redhead, you might have some keeping that, blue, uh, that pattern. Uh, the coloration but one big reason for having a blue tail when you're a baby is that blue tail is going to attract predators predators going to go after that blue tail bite it off and then um the lizard can run off and we if you know at least one good fact about lizards they regrow their tails and that is a benefit to them because they're on a lot of predators menu uh for for dining so um they need some way to, to maintain their, their life, their livelihood. So that tail uh, is a great way to uh, leave a little bit behind for the predator and get the heck out of there. So I just saw a blue-tailed skink or a, or a southeastern five-line skink, however um, you want to put it. And um, they're very fast. And getting them on camera has been tricky in the past. Sometimes one of the best ways is to um, set up a trap and then um, get them in a container where you can um, you, you kind of can slow their, their escape. Um, I have seen them in the wild. I have gotten them on camera in the wild, but I think here for St. Andrews, it's going to be uh, more I talky talk and less showy show, but that's a good one um, to bring up later if I see it, because they're really interesting, because they, they, there's a couple skinks, these fast, fast running ground lizards that um, 
they kind of do the same thing. It's very interesting and in how they spit off. Oh, hey, that was our rabbit from yesterday. Did you catch it? Now, was that an Eastern cottontail or was that a marsh rabbit? Now we are right, right next to a saltwater marsh. So, and that dark coloration could be a marsh rabbit. They're a little smaller than um, the cottontail, but cottontails can be dark. They can be, have a light coloration, they can be dark. They, they do differ. Marsh rabbits are usually a lot darker and smaller. So very cool. We, I think we saw that rabbit around here yesterday. So this must be its home where it likes to uh, graze for food. This is where we saw that deer. This, and I'm not going into all that. We did that yesterday, but this was my old stage. Yep. So I came in here and the deer was right there. And then I, I did my whole thing about the stage right here and all the old benches. But I already said all that, so we're moving on. Look at all the saw palmetto. And um, palms are, especially um, certain types, uh, are used for food. Um, you, you, a lot of people in the South, especially, can cook the palm heart. And that can be uh, a food. I, I don't typically dine on it. I heard it's okay. Oh, oh, okay, I got a lizard. Okay, do you remember when I was talking about invasives? Here's one. That looks like a Bahamian brown and all. And it gets a little hard trying to identify some of these anoles because they start breeding with each other and you get hybridization. Typically, the uh, Bahamian Cuban brown anoles are bigger and they got brown and their dewlap is a kind of a red-orange color, whereas our local green anoles have a pink dewlap. But I have seen brown anoles with crests. There is a crested brown anole. That's a totally different other species. But I'll see it. I'll see that crest on uh, you, more of your standard Bahamian anole. That means they're hibernizing. I have seen the crest on a green anole, which tells me the crested anole has bred with the green anole. So we're getting hybridization between our native local anole and the ones that come from the Bahamas and Cuba and the other islands from the Caribbean. So yeah, you can just stew on that for a little bit. All right, we're gonna go down our trail. We already talked about these guys. They're everywhere. I tried to find a ghost crab but they are hiding today. All right, I'm gonna turn this off and I'll catch you on the next bend. Okay, do you see what's right in front of me? That is a very young box turtle. Now in our area, we have the Gulf Coast box turtle and he's doing his thing. You see that nice dorsal stripe down its shell? Very cool specimen. He doesn't even look a year old. He's kind of going, what the heck is this guy doing with this camera? So these box turtles, they will hinge up their shell and put their head and their feet all the way in. So they're fully encased. He's trying to climb this log. I don't think it's gonna work. Very cute little specimen. We have, oh no, 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 he fell over. What do I do? Do I help him or do I let nature run its course? Wait, wait for it. All right, good job, dude, you rock. So anyway, we have the Gulf Coast box turtle here in my area. If you head more north, you'll be in the three-toed box turtle area. And then more in, on the east coast, you got eastern box turtles. We got down the peninsula, we got the Florida box turtle. Well, God, there's the, or, uh, the desert box turtle, the ornate box turtle when you head out to Texas. So we got a few, a few varieties here in the United States. Very cool little specimen. Box turtles, I see them all over. They are pretty common. All right. Very cool little guy. They can get pretty big here in the panhandle. The Gulf Coast box turtle is the biggest one, I believe, subspecies-wise, in the United States. They get pretty big. The colors are maybe not most glamorous, but they are big. All right, dude. Got to go. Oh, okay. I had another thought um, after seeing that awesome little baby box turtle. Um, they're very closely related to pond sliders or pond turtles. Um, they're kind of grouped together, box turtles and pond uh, turtles. Now, pond turtles are like your green-eared sliders and your yellow belly sliders. You got, um, you know, they start getting into all the cooters. I know, right? That's an interesting word. Uh, peninsula cooters, you've got chicken turtles. Um, anyway, these, those are very aquatic turtles. Uh, they 
spend a majority of their time on a pond, in a pond, or around a pond in some fashion. You typically see those guys, like the sliders, on a, on a log, usually in a row. And when they, you come upon them, they freak out and jump in the water. Now, box turtles, they do like water. We just saw that little box turtle going through like just a little bit of water here. Like I see a bunch of little frogs doing their thing. But box turtles are a little bit more terrestrial, as in land than maybe a pond slider might be. They can go more into the woods and do their thing in the woods, but they like to hang close to water. But they don't need to be in water maybe as much as, you know, the same frequency as a pond slider it does. So a box turtle, you, I can find them. I have seen them all the way from here to like, you know, Maryland. And I have never gone to Texas to the point where I've seen them out in that direction. But they're definitely in Alabama, like where they have the three toe box turtles. Um, I haven't gone south enough in Florida to see the Florida box turtle and its range has a very pretty star-like pattern, long skinny little yellow stripes on its shell as an adult. And, and they're all, they all go back to one box turtle. And uh, North America, that isn't the only one with box turtles. I believe there's a Chinese box turtle. Um, there's some other turtles in that group of the terrapines that um, have a similar or, uh, origin, an ancestor. Um, but uh, characteristic of the box turtle is going to be that hinge underneath its shell that allows it to uh, tighten up everything, the head and the, the arms and the legs and everything, so it's fully contained in its shell to protect itself from predators. Now the pond sliders that I talked about earlier, they can't do that. They're, they can tuck their arms and legs in, but they don't have a hinge. Their bottom part of their shell, of the plasterin, is fixed. So they, they're a little more aggressive. Like the pond sliders, they have bitten me. They have tried to scratch me. They got some, some serious nails. Whereas the box turtles, they can go more into a, I'm just gonna get in my home and do my thing. So, and wait till you go away. So anyway, very cool find. I've seen many box turtles at St. Andrews, um, among many other things. There are so many things, that, hey, that's a good point. There are so many things here at St. Andrews. Animals, plants, you name it. Plus, St. Andrews has history we saw the um there's a sawmill that we passed which i didn't go into detail but um there used to be a sawmill here uh they used to do turpentine they used to cut down the trees uh or, or scra uh, scar the trees and take the turp uh the sap which they uh, turned into turpentine now this was many decades ago unfortunately hurricane michael or the storms right around that period took out the turpentine mill which is nothing but a foundation now. All that really remains of that site is a couple scarred pine trees and uh, an old sawmill, which I did have footage for. There is history usually in state parks. It might be from the CCC going back to the Roosevelt times. There might be um, uh, Native American history. I mean, probably most likely so that the Native Americans were definitely, um, you know, whatever tribes were living in the area or still living in the area were using the parks for their own uses. So there's always something at a state park. And there's so many things that on an adventure that's just so great, you're probably gonna see and not see. So I hope we can see a raccoon or a ghost crab or American alligator or many, many other things that I know are here. It would be, it'd be really cool if we're just a, re a corn snake passed our trail or that water snake right there. Oh my gosh, there is a water snake right there. Look at that. And he is out of here. Okay. now. I'm going to start saying, when you're in a state park, there could just be money in front of you at any time. You could just turn around and then money will just fly in front of you. You never know. Hey, look, uh, gold nuggets are just going to drop out of the sky. Okay, so anyway, see my point? I'm literally talking about a snake as I'm coming around the corner and I look to my left and there's a snake. That was a Florida Bend and Water Snake. Earlier, I gave you a old stock footage of that of that species and there's one that was just sitting right there i'm coming around the corner gabbing talking about a red rat snake i don't get a red rat snake but i get the uh, the runner up which is a florida banded water snake right there and he scooted off that was a good specimen too that was a big boy okay yeah you never know when you're at a state park people just leave tens of thousands of dollars lying around you never know you might just walk upon it i could definitely go for that right now um i am typically at the moment, a starving artist. But starving artists always start somewhere. You have to start from the bottom to work your way up. There's only one direction from the bottom. And that's up, folks. Okay, moving on. That was pretty freaky deaky. Um, you know, you, when you're coming around the corner, you never know. There might just be beautiful women looking, trying to find a, a guy who's part artist, part scientist. You never know. They just might be so looking for um, their next life partner. You never know. Not this time. But anyway, you never know. 
Okay, that was kind of interesting. Well, I ever watch it, man. I mean, like, you know, you never know. There might be a feral pig around the corner, which, by the way, do not mess with feral pig. They are aggressive. They are an invasive brought here from Europe. Razorbacks. I went to Highland Park Elementary where I talked about Miss Stivers, my fifth grade teacher. Awesome. That was our mascot was the Razorbacks. They are aggressive and nasty and they will tear up the environment. They will dig up roots and trails and they definitely leave their calling card. Boy, that was pretty interesting with the uh, banded water snake. I literally was talking about another snake and it was right there around the corner. Huh, that's one for the books. Okay, moving on. As you can see, the trail is still flooded. Now, I've never seen an alligator through this area. I've typically seen them at the main pond that's coming up at the end of the trail. Not to say they're not here. I'm looking very carefully as I'm gabbing, talking. We're just chatting here. But um, Gator Lake is where I've had the most success seeing a crocodilian which American alligators are in that crocodilian family. Okay, folks, here's a quiz question. There is the American alligator. What is the other alligator species in the world? I'll give you two seconds. Ready, one, two. If your answer in your head, or if you said it out loud, good for you, was Chinese alligator, you are right. We have two alligators, I mean, at the moment, uh, in the, uh, extant uh living in the world american alligator and the chinese alligator but that's not the only members of the crocodilian family we have crocs like your nile crocodile but we also have caiman and gharials false gharials you ever heard of this guy a mugger it's a mugger crocodile that's pretty cool very cool little crocodilian he actually is one of the only reptiles if not the only reptile that uses tools to attract its prey that's right. It actually puts branches on its head over in Asia to attract birds looking for nesting material. So they go looking for branches and the, and the mugger puts the branches on its head. Bird comes looking for the branches and well, well the mugger gets its meal. If you figure, can figure all that one out. So anyway, really cool stuff. Love the crocodilians. American alligators don't use tools. They are that ambush hunter gets underneath that duckweed and snap. They are powerful swimmers hoping to see American alligator today, but you never know. Never know. They could be on vacation. May have gone to the Riviera. Go to have some good times in Paris. You never know. I don't know. The way flights are right now, they probably stayed in the States and just drove around in their RV. You never know. Maybe just went over to California or up, up to uh, up to the Madison Square Garden and go check out a wrestling match or some Go check some football out. But anyway, where were we? We're on the trail. We're trying to finish this up. Still haven't seen a ghost crab. Just saw a Florida banded water snake and a Gulf Coast box turtle, which I believe, oh my God, I'm going to use the Latin. I'm going to use the Latin. Terrapine Carolina Major. Bingo. Some of this sticks, like, um, I don't know why, I still remember green tree frog, Hyla Sonera. Some stick, most don't. But we talked about Carolinius. I have done my soapbox moment about Carolinius. I have nothing against him. Moving on. Okay, so we are back and we have finished that trail. We have done this trail now twice. We did it yesterday, we did it today. Hey, okay, so this is another ghost crab hole. But no ghost crab. These look like somebody's foot, footprints. They, oh, you know what? That looks like my footprint. Anyway, so moving on. So I, I suddenly feel like I'm in police academy and I'm, I'm the, the mean sergeant or whatever he was. You know, he kept saying, move it, move it. Let's go, people, move it. I don't want to become him. Nobody liked that character. I want to be Steve, um, Steve, uh, what's his face? Oh my God. Steven Gutenberg? Steven Gutenberg. Yeah, Police Academy. They got really good around two and three, maybe four or five, they were losing it. I don't know, how many did we have? Like 12? I don't know, there's a lot. Police Academy and Michael Win 
Winscott. Michael Winslow. Michael Winslow. Come on. All right. What are we doing? Looking for an American alligator. American alligator. All right. Here we go. I want apex. Dun, 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 dun. Apex predator. Bum, 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 bum. Top of the food chain. Bum, bum. Bum, bum. Bum, bum. Bum, bum. All right. So this is where we found that green anole who was hanging out on the rail. Oop, I see some anoles flying around. Might be the same species. Okay. We're gonna call it for right here and I'll catch you guys on the way to Gator Lake because I gotta cross a few streets and do a few things. Gotta, you know, use the facilities. I will see you in a few seconds. All right, see you in a bit. Look, longleaf pine, native. Okay, you see that butterfly right in front of us? So I've been trying to spit out the words, but my brain has been in, you know, pure brain fart mode. There are a couple butterflies that look very similar to the monarch. Monarch is pretty recognizable. So when you see something that's very close, but you're like, that's just not quite a monarch. There's a couple close second good guesses. So one is the Viceroy butterfly, which I think that's what's right in front of us right now. Now you'll know because it's underside of the wings have more dark black bands underneath than a uh, monarch does, and that looks like a viceroy. Now, it could be a queen butterfly, which I don't think, but you'll know you'll have a queen butterfly because underneath, there's a lot more white spots um, underneath the wing. And I, you know what? Now that I'm taking a, a better look at it, it might be a queen because it's showing me its belly. It's being extremely cooperative right now. I would like to thank, I would like to thank this butterfly for making all this possible. But I think it might now actually be a queen because I think I saw some white underneath it. So that might be, yep, that might be a queen. You see all those white spots as this guy is flapping his wings? Look at that, he's just being awesome. Wow. Well, we've, got, we've had some animals that are pretty camera shy. I would say this butterfly is a diva. Way to go, dude, or lady, ma'am. Um, all right, so I'm gonna say queen butterfly. Let's see, definitely likes the camera. Very cool. I'm gonna leave this guy alone. Very awesome. Okay, folks, I'm back with our little butterfly and it was just rubbing my brain the wrong way. It didn't, I was looking at it closer. I'm like, it can't be a queen. It can't be a viceroy. And then it hit me. It's probably a, a golf fritillary. And after checking my sources, which they're all yelling at me, it's a golf for the Larry, it's a golf for the Larry. I went, oh yeah, it's a golf for the Larry. Now I'm not, I definitely have plenty of room to expand in my insect department, but I have seen plenty of these guys. I do get occasionally a few of them mixed up, but it's a, that's a golf fritillary. Very cool. We're out in the sand dunes. It's in a family of brush footed butterflies. So it's very close to uh, the other ones I was mentioning. But very cool, golf for Tulare. Make sure we'll put that one in um, on our YouTube list. So, but that's why this actually, again, brings up such a very good point. Check your sources, go back, check more than one source, double verify. The more sources that are all saying the same thing, you're probably hitting the mark. And I am definitely scratching my head today on a few things because when you're put on camera I am now just really taking into consideration you might say something that deep in your brain is not not match, matching up your brain after a few seconds after your mouth has said what it said goes wait can we take that back because that wasn't right so What's really nice is I can come back and go, wait, I take that back. It was not a queen. It was not a viceroy. It was a golf fr fritillary. 
golf fritter larry so and i might do that on occasion i am so not perfect i tend to fly off the seat of my pants shoot from the shoot from the hip type guy but i also know when i'm wrong and that is one thing that you'll always get from me if i am wrong or if i find myself wrong or somebody calls me out and then i check their sources and i like, and i find out that they're right and i was wrong i will not deny it i am wrong plenty of times but i try my best to go find new sources that uh will help me try to be more clear for the next time so when i see that butterfly again I'll go, wait a minute, I got that mixed up with Queen and Viceroy. I'm pretty sure that's really the Gulf Rita Larry. That's how we learn, folks. And if you go look something up and you identify something and you get it wrong, that's okay. If you find out from, from, from future resource checking that you're wrong, just remember that. And you'll be better the next time. I, I, just, I just want to make sure everybody knows that going out and looking at things and getting it wrong is okay. Science can be a little harsh and they penalize you for incorrectness. And it's okay to be wrong. Just learn from it. I probably, for, this, for the simple fact that I just said on camera, on my pilot episode, no matter, a butterfly, wrong, I've been trying to think about it for like the last 48 hours, I will remember it. And that's how you learn. You actually probably learn more from failure than anything. Moving on. Move it, move it. Okay, where are we going? We're going back to Gator Lake. It's so hard to get over there. All right, see you over there. I am on my way to Gator Lake and I know yesterday we saw this site and go into it, but that is what's left of the foundation of the turpentine mill. Those are some of the longleaf pines right there that um, they used to score for the sap to turn the turpentine mill. I remember Spending a lot of time in that mill. It's just in my brain now. Okay. But we still have the old saw um, mill that the, the the blade for chopping up the trees. Uh, it was definitely donated and brought to us by some really awesome people and a Boy Scout troop. That's awesome. So, yeah. There is history at this park. Maintaining this history is going to be tough as hurricanes keep, keep <laughs> rolling through. But um, there's also World War II history here. I know they had an old uh, World War II uh, uh, machine gun platform or uh, uh, cannon platform for, for submarines. If, during World War II, they were afraid that submarine would come into our bay. So there's history here. I imagine many a an arrowhead or pottery artifact. We have a really nice visitor center here at St. Andrew State Park. It's some very nice money and an effort and thought went into that. One of my favorite guys of all time, uh, Ranger Rick who I knew when I was an AmeriCorps member. He was awesome, gave me some great ideas for my art projects, uh, like my big AmeriCorps art, art project that I did. Um, he, gave, he was awesome, he taught me a lot, he gave me some bunch of free posters. There is a plaque, a, an honorary poster of him, a picture at the visitor center. So you can see uh, Ranger Rick, a guy that I used to know, great aquarium, great, great um, taxidermy, all kinds of stuff about the seashells and uh, the sea turtle hatchings that occur here on our beach because we do get some sea turtles uh, uh, laying their nests here on our the beaches. So really great visitor center. It's a great park. It's got a lot of history. It's got a lot of great nature. Of course, you can go to the beaches, get your tan on, you know, go do some wind stuff in, you know, you know, be like a cool bro dude, you know, go like, you know, go, go soak in some sun and some, uh, some, some pretty ladies, you know. So anyway, so we're going on to Gator Lake. I just wanted to show this one more time because this is history. I would like to show everything that I can on my adventure. And this is going back over like, like 100 years. This is uh, many decades. So there's always something that you can find. And I say take it all in. Take in the history, take in the science, take in the biology, take in whatever you can that can improve you, make you better, make you um, smarter, you learn something. Something that you can go home and tell your friends, tell your family, be like, guess what I did today? Well, that's just my thought on, on it all. All right, where are we going? Oh yeah, Gator Lake. It takes like four hours to cross like a quarter of a mile. Okay, we are on our way to Gator Lake. Battery's doing okay, but I gotta, gotta move this along. The one reason I definitely wanted to pull the camera out is because we have another deer sighting for our, our weekend. A pretty little girl. Boy, this one's on a move. 
so where's the rest of the family? I have seen five deer, a herd of deer, at least five or six here at St. Andrews before in a group. So this can't be a, like a little solo deer. Where's mama? Where's the brother and sister? So over here on the right was the very uh, abundant white egret nesting area that had zicho. And I hear a deer taking a swim. There she goes. Doing the hop. She can still see me. I can see her flicking her tail. Like the one yesterday was flicking its tail. It's a good signal to other, to either the predator or to other deer that um, there's danger nearby. Um, they uh, The white-tailed deer here right in front of us uses that tail as a, uh, a uh, kind of like a, the flags that the guy, uh, like the guy has at the airport trying to flag in the, um, the airplanes. That tail is a great uh, signal. I can still see her just past that palmetto. And she's still flicking that white tail. And that can work um, in her advantage too with a predator because the predator might be going after that tail and it could be a way to like uh, take it off the main, uh, main uh, areas of the deer that could be destructive to the deer if the predator would be able to get on. It's like, like the neck area. Uh, chest heart area where um, uh, vital injuries could be um, could be inflicted so if you have something that's distracting the predator like the tail it could uh, uh, confuse it but it also works well for signaling other deer hey I'm over here something's up my ears are up I, I sense a predator if I'm gonna go here's my tail follow me and again no white egret I see a couple maybe in the distance. Oh, you know what I see? You know, I see way on the distance. I don't know if this camera is going to pick it up, but right in front of me, up, up on this tree right here, I see an anhinia. And that is a weird bird. It's like a snake bird going in the water and um, it has this long snake neck. And it's uh, genus and species, go Carolinus is Anhinia Anhinia. Very cool bird, black with white lines. So our deer is gone, but we got an Anhinia way off in the distance. I do see a couple of great white egrets, but they're way the heck away. So, all right, let's go over to Gator Lake. So I found, I got one more Anhinia and it's right in front of me, right there above my finger on this uh, log. A little bit closer uh, look at the Anhinia. The snake neck bird will hang out in water. Its head will poke up like a snake. Very cool bird. Definitely will go underwater looking for its food source. They'll come up on a log and then put their wings out, take in the sun. Very awesome bird. Very uh, South United States bird. I always thought they were interesting. Very unique among the other birds, the other egrets and herons that kind of have more of a grouping. We are back like yesterday over at Gator Lake. Taking the trail. Where we found that Easter ribbon snake. Heading to that one spot with the sign. And of course we know this tree. I talked all about that tree yesterday. That's a live oak. This is a live oak. Very cool. So that was the sleeping tree. Duckweed down there, that green muck. Here we go. Are we going to find the main goal of our pilot episode? Alligator Mississippi Mississippi. Mississippi Sai. Mississippi knee. Alligator, Mississippi. Okay, it's an American alligator. Here we go. Now, is there anybody down here? Are we ruining somebody's end of trail experience? No, we're not. Good. So this loudmouth Floridian can come down here and do his thing before more guests show up. Because I would hate to take any guests to Florida's uh, brand, you know, experience St. Andrews away. Because I've been here a thousand times. I do not see an alligator. I do see a sign with an alligator on it. Hey, look, we got to see an American alligator today. And all you're going, that's not, that's not the real thing. Okay. So, no. We can go check the platform. I'm not really expecting. Oh, I see, um, I don't know if you can see a pink flower right there. That looks like a uh, morning glory. I love morning glories. Awesome. Okay. So, we've got a bunch of, uh, Awesome plants. My brain just went bye-bye. 
But um, we got our island out in the back with um, where we see the egrets and herons. No American alligator, that's okay. My trail from back in the day is totally underwater. I used to go that way and see like moccasin moms with their babies all around. Very cool. So I just want to conclude right here that this whole experience, this whole adventures with Scotty Armstrong is to get you to learn to want to learn, to have the passion to learn, to maybe learn about something you don't know about, science, to get out and explore. There's a whole world out there. All you have to do is go look for it. I want to go see the world, and I want to share it with you. You come along with me. I'm going to get some things probably a little bit wrong, maybe half wrong, maybe mostly wrong, but I will go look it up, double check, check your sources. When I put the list down, you go check, you learn, then you go out and go see it for yourselves. That's the point of all of this. I'm glad that you're coming with me. We'll go share some adventures, but I want you to go have your adventures too. You go explore. It's a big world out there. So I'm going to finish up here and then um, whatever else I see, I'll record. I'll see you guys next time. Well, my day is just about done. Um, I just came across a really cool couple. Um, one guy from uh, the Okefenokee area over in Georgia, which is on my list for season one, one of my episodes. He said he grew up with alligators. He, I mean, he used to go in and just fish inside the swamp. And he would tell me he would uh, be in a 14 foot boat and he would come across gators that were as long as his boat. Now that is about, I mean, gators will, they grow like all reptiles until the day they die. They just, their rate of growth decreases as they age. They grow really fast those first four or five years and then that rate really slows down. But they keep shedding or shed, shedding their exterior skin. Snakes, malt, shed, etc., etc., etc. They keep growing. It just that rate slows. So anyway, you could find a 16 foot alligator. You could find an 18 foot alligator. Is that like the record? Yeah, that would be like the record. I think the record's in like Louisiana or Alabama. It's like 18 feet close to 18 feet it's debatable a lot of people are like mine's bigger well no mine's bigger but anyway 16 feet is like a great it's a granddaddy you find 14 foot still old so anyway really cool just wanted to share that i do want to go over there um did not find one on this trip didn't even find a ghost crab but that's that's the whole point you never know what you're gonna find we did see some cool snakes though um i was telling the uh the guy that i saw on the trail that um one of the biggest alligators I ever saw was a 10-footer. It was at St. John's River. And I used to run that trail. That was one of my 10-mile trails. And when I was in a canoe at the St. John's River, I did have an alligator come by me, and it was bigger than my canoe. So it had to be at least 11, 12 feet. And you start realizing that you're in their world. They're the apex predator. They're the, the top predator. I'm in the water. He's better in the water than I am. So that's when I really respected them. Like, or if I hadn't respected them, that's when the respect came in. So very cool. I gotta start um, really thinking about ending this all because my battery's getting low and I gotta go uh, do all the editing and stuff. So thanks again. Okay. I just did an ending. It was a good ending. I didn't mind it. I liked it. I wanna do ending 2.0, an ending to an ending. Okay, the day is getting very busy. It's very touristy uh, state park, and we get a lot of people here. And I didn't want to. They were coming, and I didn't want to like have them feel like they have to be silent because there's a guy with a camera and he's talking. And it's like, oh, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to screw up what he's doing. So I just cut it short. I want to say something to y'all because because you followed me for like over two hours worth of footage. If you if you watched it from beginning to end, thank you. Um, I, like I said earlier, this is a learning experience for everybody and I can't be wrong, but I'm gonna try to give you the best, best what I can do. This is like my, this is my final thought. Oh my God. I'm channeling Jerry Springer. This is like the final thought. I have a master's degree from Eastern Michigan University in ecology and evolutionary biology. I also have some degrees, some schooling in other fields, especially in theater film and media arts, and uh, fine arts as well. So I, I really do, I do a lot of that. Um, 
I, I'm an artist and a scientist. But I, I, what I want to do in my science, my education that I, I just finished up, is to bring it to the world. I don't want to go out in the woods and study something that will get published only for the super elite. I want the world of people who, the world out there that doesn't know science, that, that doesn't read journals, and doesn't do all the stuff that I was just around, all the people with master's degrees and PhDs. I want to do this for the folks who who are intimidated by science, who think they can never be a scientist. Because you know what? You can be a scientist. There's just certain ways you need to kind of observe the world around you, take in the information, try to put pieces together. We're, I'm in an ecosystem. I am surrounded by the saw palmetto. I got, I got a, a bit of water right here where things live. Plants make taking energy from the sun, their food source, they add shelter for other animals. There's a whole ecosystem all happening here. They all have ecosystem services, the way they provide for people. They do things. They have net net production for making carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus. They do things with minerals. They have There's abiotic going on with the, the minerals, with the biotic, which is the living. There's so much to learn if you're passionate about it, but you don't have to go and just be intimidated by all those books and the big schooling. You can just start by going out and exploring. And I'm hoping that that's what this show is going to do, is that I could bring it to you a little bit more on, on that level. Not up here with like, well, I don't believe he's using that correct, the correct pronunciation. I'm going to have to give him a C minus and his blah, 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 blah. No, I don't want to be like that. No, I, first of all, I've never, I've never been like that up here. I want to be, I just want to be where... If this was Dungeons and Dragons, this would be the common tongue. And for all the folks out there that know what I'm talking about, that's right. This is common tongue science. So if you're an amateur um, or a, a civilian scientist, someone who takes in science and then um, adds it to databases, or if you're a professional scientist, I, I hope this will help add a little bit to your life, help you go out and explore, get out of the, get out of the lab, get out of the office. Or if you're, if you're not into science, get out of your house, get off your couch, go out. There's so much nature. And I'm not talking about just Florida or just the United States. If you're seeing this and you can understand my English, this is being interpreted into some other language. Wherever you are, I'm pretty sure you have nature wherever you're at. Even a desert. Even a tundra. Ooh, that's a big word. Tundra. It's not really a really big word. It's just an interesting word. Tundra. Or taga. Anyway, those areas are all ecosystems. They have something that's going on similar to here just maybe not on the same level of, of output you know there's always life just gotta go looking for it if you're in a desert anyway that, that might be a little harder but you can do it there's desert there's cacti there's desert horses you know what i'm saying you know what i'm saying just get out go so this was the pilot episode thank you for coming to st andrew's state park with me um this is a very long final thought but i i, I have the battery for it um our next episode which is technically episode one will be at conservation park and i'm pretty sure we're going to see an american alligator so we didn't hit our goal today didn't see a ghost crab but maybe some some future adventure we will see those animals i will put the list of everything i saw today i'm going to have a bunch of footage that i didn't say anything but I, you might see a bird you might see some kind of gelatinous material on the water why don't you go look that up See, if you see some an image and I put a name down, see if you can match the name to what I show you. There's probably going to be at least 10 animals or plants that I'm just going to give you a, a, a quick blip about. And then you can go look it up. You can go research. If you have the internet or a library, yes, a library where they use these things called books with paper and binding. I know it's so 1985, but go somewhere. Internet's probably the most you're going to use and look this up more than one res uh, research spot use two or three or four and and double check learn so i will catch you on our next adventure thank you for joining me again on uh this whole new project uh the adventures of scotty armstrong and i will see you guys next time
we've got seaweed. I see a bird hovering in the distance. Do you see that? I see that. It's coming near us. Looks like... That looks like an osprey, folks. We've got an osprey. Beautiful. Lots of uh, fish-going predator birds. Those bird of prey with the white heads, like the bald eagle, they tend to like fish. There's a good chance if your bird of prey you're looking at has a white head, it probably dines on fish. So the next question is, why would a bird of prey need or evolve to have a white head? Mwaha, that's a good question. We'll save that for the credits. So all this right here, all this was a beach shore with trees. And then they put those jetties in during our I guess it was the oil spill, the BP oil spill, right around that era, 2009. So by putting a big break of jetties right there, where do you think the current's going to come and start sweeping away beach shore and trees? Right here. So I would say for the last 10 or 12 years, I have slowly watched this shoreline disappear. All these tree stumps here were, were trees. And I was walking like 40 feet out that way on a shoreline with trees right here. So I know I've had one or two professors tell me that they've requested to have those jetties removed. Hasn't happened yet. Okay, moving on. All this right here was trees and bushes and not a roaded away shore shoreline. It's very interesting. Sad, interesting, however you want to look at it. Ah. All right.